Good afternoon, everybody. I'm Victor Kush. Uh, thank you for joining us for the DA and VC panel. And uh, we have with us today Clint Cornover. He's managing director of Ulu Ventures, a VC firm in Silicon Valley. We have Tom Kaler, who is president of CrowdSmart, a um, angel and, and uh, collective intelligence funding platform for entrepreneurs. And we have Kamal Anbarshi. He is the Vice President and Managing Executive for Chevron Ventures out of Houston. And um, so you've all got their bios, so I'm not going to introduce the, <laughs> all their qualifications. They're all PhDs and all that stuff, right? So, <laughs> um, but what I want to ask them is, what is it that got you into venture capital to begin with? What, what is it that interested you in getting into uh, funding entrepreneurial ventures. Start with Clint. All right, well, so I've been interested in venture capital. I know, sometime in college, I read about these venture capitalists. I was like, well, that sounds like the coolest job I can imagine. It's like, you know, you get these like parade of people coming through talking about how they're planning to change the world with cool new technology. And matter of fact, that was what brought me out to Silicon Valley to begin with. It's like, I just wanted to be like, there's just so much exciting stuff there that I wanted to be around it. And it took me 15 years to break into venture capital. So it was always kind of out there, but it's a bit of a hard field to get into. So, but, uh, but yeah, the interest was like way back when. So um, I'm actually uh, an entrepreneur. Uh, seri I've done it many times over. So I was CEO of the first AI company to go public, but I've done a lot of money raising. And money raising is not easy. Um, and, uh, and a couple of times I was successful. So my first two companies went public. So I got recruited to be you know, part of a venture capital team a couple of times. And I always liked building teams. And then I, but eventually as I went through my career, I thought I want to make it possible for, I had to move pretty much to Silicon Valley. I grew up in Pennsylvania. I moved to Silicon Valley to be part of a startup. I uh, spun out of Stanford University, which is where it all started. And I went out in 1982, and I've been loving it ever since. But what got me into the venture side, and actually we decided to do it more like, how can we make a system that helps any investor, anyone that would like to be an angel investor or you know, accredited investor, family office, whatever, have a system whereby they can get the best due diligence on startups using the best of uh, uh, collective intelligence, artificial intelligence to create a predictive platform for startups. Think of like a Moody's for, or credit score for startups. So you could go in and say, hey, that's a 95. I want to put some money into that one. And so that was the vision for CrowdSmart in the company. So it really was not, it's not kind of the same as uh, me being a professional, I'm a technology guy, created a platform that makes it possible for uh, investors to look at startups and decide which are the good ones that are going to produce a profitable return on investment. So we've been doing this now for the last three, four years and got a couple, uh, 25 companies and seems to be working pretty accurately. So I, I came at it a different way, is really through technology. So I have a passion that any smart individual that has a great idea uh, that's fundable and will produce a great company, whether they are on the Gaza Strip or in Palo Alto, uh, can have access to capital. So that's kind of the vision that drove me into this. Excellent. So um, if, you, if you haven't decided what you want to be when you grow up, I think venture capital is the right place to be. <laughs> you get to learn continuously. You have smart people coming, pitching their ideas, and it's very challenging. And you get to learn from DNAs to fusion and drill bits. So it is, it is if you are hungry, hungry for information, that is the place to be. And, uh, and I have been with Chevron 28 years. About six years ago, opportunity came in. I liked the title, you know, so I said, well, that's, that's a good one to take it. And I also knew the person who had the job before me, and, and I knew how much fun they had. It is, um, and as Tom stated, it's a great way to nurture um, smart people and help them achieve their goals. Uh, it's very cooperative um, in an environment that we invest with um, our competitors together, that they could be competitors in other areas. It's a wonderful environment of nurturing you know, talent, 
and uh, making, making tomorrow a better place. So that's a wonderful place to be. Thank you, guys. So uh, as I ask the next question, uh, I'd like to encourage all of you to think about your questions and submit them so that I can start uh, pitching them to this panel. And uh, so the next question I have for you all is, we're all in the business of getting capital in the hands of entrepreneurs who have solutions to global challenges. A classic decision that entrepreneurs actually have is whether to seek capital to begin with. So how would you advise entrepreneurs about whether they should seek capital and the decision analysis frame around making that decision? Well, come on, I think you've, okay. got, you've, got, you've got the acid test. <laughs> <laughs> I'll, I'll start. It, it depends on what your objective function is, right? So if you um, want to own your business and you know, bootstrap it, grow it, and if you have the means to be able to get financing at a certain level, uh, by no means. I, I don't think you need the, the venture capital. But if you, are, um, if you have a great idea and you want to implement it and you want the largest impact as quickly as possible, and at one point you, know, you, you want to be rich and then start your next company, I think venture capital is, is the way to go. So depending on the objective function, and you need to, you need to also understand what options they have. It's not just whether you get venture capital or not. Who you get it from is very important. Um, who's your board structure? What do they bring in? Is it only money? And if it is only money you want, you really don't want to come to me. You know, the corporate one, and my, my objective is to create suppliers for Chevron, and we can provide other things. So it, it depends on the objective function, but people need to realize there's pros and cons of, of everything else and depending on your objective function. Well, give, give them the board story. <laughs> Oh, uh, all right, so uh, we were talking last night. Um, there are quite a few great s companies, and this is a description of startup we discussed in the workshop yesterday, um, and they, are, you know, they would like to take your money, but the issue is they are owner-operated companies. They are not startup companies, and um, we don't want to waste their time, and I'm very direct. Some people may think sometimes maybe too direct, one question that I ask entrepreneurs coming in, right off the bat, if you are raising capital, are you comfortable having a board that can fire you? Not necessarily they will, but the control needs to be on the board, not the owner operator. For me, I don't know, maybe Clint invests <laughs> differently. So, so the, the environment I've been living in around uh, the Bay, San Francisco Bay Area is almost every startup I see is looking to get capital. So I don't, you don't see a lot of people trying to make that decision whether or not to raise. I think that, so the environment I have been in is that. So the, the thing I would say, if they are looking to get venture capital, they get involved in an accelerator or some process where they can get some feedback of what it means. And I'd say a lot of venture capital is broken, other than Clint's company. Uh, I'm joking, because actually they, they, provi too, yeah. <laughs> they provide transparency. And one of the things that almost no venture capitalist does is tell a company what they need to do to actually become a venture-funded company. We either say, gosh, you guys are great. We love you. Sorry, it's just not a good timing right now for us. And of course, because all VCs want to be loved by their startup, so they, they'll never say no. Uh, whereas what they need to know is, some of the things here, these are some of the things you might encounter. And accelerators or venture processes, and the reason I say this about Ulu is they have a, they tell people what's going on once they get to that level. There needs to be some level of what does it mean and how does it, how do you function as, as a startup? So I, I don't encounter a lot that uh, aren't looking for capital, but I would say what a lot of them are looking for is intelligence as to how to get funded and build their businesses. Yeah, so I guess I'd put out there that seeking venture capital is a little bit of a dangerous thing in the sense that there's venture capitalists are looking for one thing, which is outlier successes. And if you've got a business you're building that can be a nice cash flowing business, I mean, generate a real healthy quality of life, that is not a possibility if you get venture funding. So it's basically all or nothing with venture funding. So if the, you think about the odds here, and I'm gonna make some numbers up, but they'll be directionally correct. If for you as the founder of a company, if you get venture funding, there's an 80% chance you walk away with zero. 
nothing. By the way, it's not quite so bad for me. I might get my money back in an acquisition, but I get my money back before you get anything. So 80% chance it's a zero. So 15% chance you get to buy a house out of this thing and 5% chance that it changes your life. So that's kind of what you're looking for. And so the question is, you know, what are you giving up to go get that? And if you're giving up a nice lifestyle where you're getting paid and have a comfortable, it's like that might not be a great trade-off for you. And I think that goes back to the board question, right? Exactly. exactly. <laughs> are, are, you, are you willing to be fired mm -hmm. as a founder? Mm -hmm. <laughs> Absolutely. Well, okay, so um, we've got a question for Clint. As a partner at Ulu, are you worried about uh, solutions like CloudSmart uh, or maybe excited about solutions like that? Oh, so totally excited. So I, I, so I look at like the venture capital industry. By the way, I, so I raised venture capital. I spent 15 years starting companies. And from the outside looking in, it seemed like a pretty messed up industry. Now that I've been on the inside for 10 years, it's way more messed up than it ever was. <laughs> Thank you. I was trying to be polite. <laughs> so so, so I, I, feel, I feel like a little bit like a, uh, you know, like a voice in a wilderness here. I mean, like literally 10 years ago, I went and talked to some colleagues that I knew in the venture capital industry. And I said, well, yeah, I want to, you know, do this venture thing. And we, I started out as an angel investing investor in own, own capital. It's like, how do you do it? You know, because I'm looking to learn here. And literally every single person I said basically came down to, you just have to have the magic. I'm like, really? We've known each other for how long and this is the best you got for me? And, I was, and then I was like, well, you know, I've got this thing called decision analysis. You know, we kind of quantify risks and put a little structure around the logic. And people were like, clink, 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 clink. You just don't get it. Yeah, there are some people that try to go do this, and by and large, you have know, junior folks working on market size data, and nobody pays any attention to them. So it's like, ah, oh, well, I'm either going to end up being a genius or an idiot by the time I'm done with this thing. And there's a, now there's a, there's a little bit more momentum. There's a few other organizations that are starting to uh, apply some logic and some data, and to me, it feels like, you know, I'd love to be part of a wave here. So two thumbs up on CrowdSmart. Thank you. <laughs> uh, well, yeah. So just a, a, a comment. I, I I do think there is a, a wave happening of more, because some of the it goes back to the first question. Some of the very very best startups are getting very smart about really wanting to get the input and intelligence about how to uh, approach it. And they look at there are other alternatives that are bubbling up. They're not there yet by any means. I mean. Crowdfunding right now doesn't work. Despite our name, we are not a crowdfunding company. We are only accredited investors. Uh, but uh, things like ISOs and other things like that that are bubbling up as access to capital, which are challenging uh, venture capital, and they will continue to challenge and will cause a transformation, I think. So we have a, a question for the whole panel, I think, which is, um, do you want startups to have a probabilistic view of cash flows, demands, and various other elements of their business? Has anyone here done sales forecasting? <laughs> I mean, you got to have a probabilistic view of uh, what outcomes are going to, I mean, I actually did a chart just a couple of days ago about for a startup that said, you know, here's our goal, and then here's all the pathways you might go in terms of getting traction. And any time you're out there looking, you might find one that'll move you a little bit more along the path. So I think in general, when companies are trying to get traction, they're looking at probabilistic outcomes and the most likely ones to get them to a strategic goal. So I, I believe it's very much a part of how they should be thinking. Yeah. yeah, the answer is yes, and the value is in the process, right? Looking at their markets and the segments and what will take in each step and the timing itself and what to do and different probabilities on it, it will help. It will help in the, the model Clint has too, so when we put them in. Yeah, the answer is yes. Um, you'll be skeptical of the, of the results in general, but seeing the process that they go through to come to it is very important to see whether they have an understanding. Yeah, well, so I guess, so I do the seed stage stuff, so the really early. So it's a bonus if you have a view of how you're going to spend your money. And, and, and you, you laugh, but, but there, there, there are some amazing, call it 
technologists out there who have things that are going to change the world who don't have clue one in terms of like, okay, what are all the expenses that are going to line up? They know they have to go hire a few engineers, but then there's like this whole infrastructure of starting a company. And, and the way I look at it is that's a learning curve that's easier to move up than how are you going to solve a problem that matters to folks. So, so, so it's, not, it's not like a killer for me if people come in with an unsophisticated view on this. Um, and to the extent that they get probabilistic, that's great. And the, the thing I really want to see is, okay, suppose things don't work out like you've planned. It takes you three times as long and twice as much money. Are you going to die? Or is there a way for you to continue to survive under that scenario? You know, upside is kind of like, okay, that'll take care of itself. So, so that's a good lead in to the next question, which is how do you decide when to kill or not pursue a startup? Those are two very different Th questions. Those are, those are two different decisions, yes, but someone... Uh... Um, we, we're probably unique in that we pull together a unique set of evaluators for each startup, and we trained a model over the last four years, and I honestly have to tell you, if the number's in a certain range and the data's in a certain range, we invest. So we're... We're essentially trusting a collective intelligence systematic approach to that. Now, we'll find out how good or bad that, so far it's looking pretty good. We've got 25 companies, everybody's still alive, knock on something, and, <laughs> uh, and some, have, some are doing really well. But we're, I mean, and this has been at the first, and a little bit of insight, is it the, we have an investment committee, but the, and, and the investment committee includes some traditional VCs, they really feel uncomfortable with this because it's, there's no, you can't touch your, the end of the magic. You gotta just go look at the data. Is the data adequate? Uh, you can only critique the process. And I've had investment committee members pounding the table saying, I hate this deal, but we're gonna go with it because the system said so. So watch this space. We'll see how this experiment goes, but we do not make that decision. We put a decision process in place that we trust. How about you, Cabal? When, when are you going to stop killing companies? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we never do. Um, so th the first part of the answer is that I think that the, the entrepreneur should decide to kill the company when the opportunity cost of doing something else is, is becomes too much, right? So you have something, you're trying something else better that you can do, and you need to pivot and change. Uh, but as a corporation, we never kill startups, right? So the, the, the way that the boards usually work on the tail end, people kind of give up. Um, you, you don't walk away from it, and that's a very painful death. It's, it, it, it's much better you know, at a point that you just go, okay, this is, you know, we are not trying to put good money after bad. Um, it actually hurts the entrepreneur, it hurts the company trying to push it forward. It is time to pivot. And <clears throat> that happens quite often, actually, in the sense that you get a clean close, right? So you just pay the bills, everybody is happy, close the door, move on. And that happens more than probably people think it does. Um, but it doesn't happen quickly enough. There's always a partner that would like to take it further. And, and, if, and it's in several cases, actually, they were able to take control and, and do something else with the company. And that works out well. Um, yeah, it's, it's, it's never like a traffic accident and there's a trauma and the patient is gone. It's mostly, you know, you have well, with a your companies, visits. maybe my, my, mine have some of those. <laughs> yeah. So for, for earlier on in the seed stage, right, you are coming in, the attrition rate is a lot quicker and probably it's a lot easier to do that. When well, you, are well, when you run out of money, it gets kind of dicey. <laughs> <laughs> it's called oxygen. Yeah. You cut off the oxygen. So that's the other thing that, you know, <laughs> probably most of the time we have access to more money to keep it going on the drip. Right. So that well, may not be the best case. So I think the killing a, a, a company is sort of an interesting question. So think about like, so when we make an investment, and even when we show up on a board, really, really, the big decision that I have to make is do we write another check or not? So I mean, everything else is essentially the entrepreneurs have control over, and I might have some influence, and I might have a strong point of view, but at the end of the day, my decision is do I write another check? And so let's say you have a company where, you know, it looked really exciting in the beginning, and things take a lot longer, the market's not there. They're basically, from our point of view, we say, oh what, that upside possibility that got us excited in writing a check is no longer there. I mean, maybe this can still be a viable company, but a much smaller kind of company. So in our business model, that company's now become rounding error. So if you look at the business model of venture capital, like we're making, call it 70 investments in our portfolio, 
and there's only going to be seven that matter, and really there's probably like two that drive over half the profitability. So if a company's in trouble, whether I get 30 cents on the dollar or 60 cents on the dollar in an acquisition, like I said, it's total rounding error. And, and so we have this conversation with the entrepreneurs. Well, so an entrepreneur, you know, things are going badly. We sit down and they say, you know, it just doesn't look like there's a market here, at least the big one that we all hoped for. So it's not worth any more of our time or our money. Now, from your point of view, you might have other reasons why you want to keep continuing, in which case, you know, more power to you, but, you know, we're not showing up supporting. Now, you might think that sounds kind of harsh. When I've had that conversation, it's been a huge relief to the entrepreneur. And the entrepreneur knows it's not going well. I mean, that's not a surprise to them. And a lot of these entrepreneurs have a huge, take on a huge amount of responsibility for seeing that their investors get their money back. I mean, I find it really gratifying, actually, that they care so much about, they brought these folks to the table, brought me to the table, and they really care about Ulu getting their money back. And when I say, hey, look, there's this thing called good decisions, decisions and outcomes, all right? So I would call investing in you a good decision. It's been a bad outcome. We're big boys and girls. We can handle the loss. And if it's, you know, and so you have done right by us in taking a great shot at it. So if you walk away now, because by the way, I mean, there's a reason we invested in you. You're a talented individual. You've got lots of opportunities. And so, you, so if you want to walk away now, it's totally fine with us. And like I said, if you want to continue for you know, another couple of years and see if you can get an acquisition out of it, that's cool too. So just to add, and, and if they start a new company, next one? Yeah, please Europe, come talk. Again. Yeah, please exactly. come talk to me. Exactly. So, I mean, my companies have more survival rates, about 60%, and this for the statistics is pretty good because we are coming in late and there's a product and such most of the time. Um, but we also have the metrics in it. So I don't like doing internal runs without external money coming in. And if it's after a few runs, you are not getting external money, I'm not going to write more money. So those are the kind of things we, we say it up front to the entrepreneur so they know. That's the case that, that so, you know, we are not going to keep on giving you money if you mm -hmm. cannot get external money go forward. Mm -hmm. So that makes it clear in a way, it makes it easier. And it's, it's always personal. When you are dealing with the startups, you know, that's wonderful that it's nurturing, you are there but everything is very personal. So you need to be very upfront, very clear, and decision analysis helps. So you just show them, you know, start, and you say, this is where we are. Um, unless certain things change and the parameters here, this is the outcome. Well, so somebody really liked your first set of answers about why you got into the industry because they're starting a VC fund, and mm -hmm. so, so they'd like to know uh, what common mistakes can you avoid before they get started. Starting a VC firm? Mm -hmm. I, I would ask the first question, why? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, because it's not easy. I mean, I, I, mean, I think they're, uh, and if they, and do, they, do you have a track record of managing money? Uh, because these are all things that, because it's a bootstrapping process. I mean, I, I know, uh, particularly if you don't, I mean, because I'm, uh, one of the people here is in terms of going out and raising money that didn't have a money management background. In fact, they had a PhD in applied physics. So, you know, what is, uh, and so the thing you have to do is you take a little bit and you show you can manage a little bit. Then you take a little bit more and show you can manage that. Unless you have, if you have a track record where you can show past performance, that helps. But I think one of the things I consider is going in is, Talk to a lot of people who built funds uh, and find out what do you really need to be able to do to do that. I mean, I, I, I don't, it's not as easy as it might look. Well, I, I guess I just, I just say a couple of things out there about the economics of venture. And uh, it sounds like, by the way, so there, there's some venture capitalists that make money hand over fist, they're billionaires, all that kind of stuff, right? So you read about them in Fortune and Forbes and whatnot. Well, let's just say, there's a lot fewer of them than folks on Wall Street. So if you want to go make money, hedge funds is a much easier way and higher probability way to do it than venture capital. And in the business schools, I'm, I'm a PhD in engineering too, but I know folks in business schools. And they talk about, if you want to make money, you go to Wall Street. If you want to have fun, you go do venture capital. <laughs> and, and, and actually, if you look at most venture capitalists, there's this thing called, so venture capitalists make money two ways. There's fees and there's carry. So, so two and 20 is a standard business model. So let's, let's pick a, pick a, let's say you're a $100 million fund. 
you get 2% fees every year on that fund. So you've got $2 million to essentially support everything you're doing. By the way, this is all the lawyers, this is the employees, this is your office space, this is traveling to conferences, right? I mean, so, so it, at $100 million, actually 2% gets spent pretty quickly. And then, the, so really what you're betting on is that 20% what they call carry. So carry is essentially of the profit you make, so the first 100 million goes back to your investors, and then anything above 100 million, you get 20% of that. Sounds good, except when you're in the seed stage, it takes about 10 years from first investment to when you actually get exited on this stuff. Oh, by the way, you're starting to invest for four years, and so in your fund, your last investment in the fund calls it four years after you've raised, that's got a 10 year life. So you're 14 years from the very beginning until your last companies start to pay out. And oh, by the way, all the money you make is in those last companies because the first companies that pay out are all going back to your investors. So you're basically, you know, realistically speaking, well, realistically speaking, most folks in venture have never gotten a carry check. <laughs> but if you're gonna get a carry check, it's like, you know, 10, 15 years out. So uh, Clint, you also said something yesterday. Um, when you start a venture fund, you know, your deal flow, why will be people coming to you versus going to the smart money? So mm -hmm. you also need to establish that if you are starting a venture fund that, that you will get the good deals and why are they coming to you and not going to the top 20% venture? So you need to be very clear where you will get the deal flow and why the, those great deals are coming to you and not going to people who have been doing it for 15, 20 years and have a track record. Thank you guys. Um, so, Tom, a question to you about how does uh, CrowdSmart work in terms of uh, funding early stage companies? So, how is that decision made? Um, so, the, I'll very quickly try to uh, describe the process. So, let's say you're a startup that wants to be funded. We typically source out of the best accelerators. So, or we work with a you know, venture partner like uh, an early stage venture company like Anulu or someone else. So that's the very first thing is we are not first money in. So just start with that. Uh, typically what we then, what happens is you go through a process as a startup where it's a deal room and you'll have built around you a kind of dynamic investment committee for your company, which to the startups that benefit are people who typically will have expertise in your industry and they'll have some investment experience in your industry. And you go through a process where they, we collect a lot of data. I won't go into the details on that, but we assess things like market, product, uh, team, network associated with the group of people pulling this company together and then the deal terms, all of that. All of that data is collected, a heavy amount of natural language analysis, runs to a model and at the end of about three weeks, we can predict a score. And if that score is high enough, we write a check. Uh, and all of the evaluators who wish to can write a check alongside into a special purpose vehicle and you get an aggregate fund from CrowdSmart. So it is a very much a database thing. And as a founder, you get to participate in looking at the diligence, responding to all the issues, and so it's very transparent. And so that's, that's basically how the process works. And then once that's in, we also, we will uh, in some cases go do follow on rounds as well. So we will you know, invest in the follow on series A or whatever. Excellent. Kamal, can you talk to us about how large corporations leverage venture capital in order to um, improve their business, consider new opportunities, change processes? Um, uh, sure. There are different objectives for the corporations to have corporate venturing group. And some has corporate venturing looking at an M&A, looking at the new business lines that they can generate. And you know, some, like ours, our main objective is to create suppliers for Chevron and for the industry. So I'll, I'll talk to more detail on, on what we do. And, uh, and, and how we do it. And it's, I think our, our part is the most fun part of it because it's very cooperative. I'm not um, trying to block somebody else to become a, a, a customer of the company that I invest. We actually co-invest with um, 
al almost all of the IOCs or even the service companies. There's a company that I invested with, uh, Total, BP, Conoco, and uh, I think ENI was in it as well. So um, and it, that, is, that is very common for us to do so because as big as Chevron is, we are not big enough to make the market for one of these products and we do not seek exclusivity. So we, we come in, uh, we bring money, and usually other IOCs follow Chevron's investments. We've been doing it for about 20 years now. And uh, that kind of provides equity support, but it also provides an on-ramp uh, to be able to do business with large corporations. It's, it's really not easy to get on the supplier list, and we, we provide means to do, to do so uh, as well. We do not take um, voting board positions, because my free share duty is always to Chevron. But we are, um, and the board is an observer, and on understanding the direction of the company, we do not take controlling interest either. So if the company wants to pivot to something else, I jokingly say this, but this is true, I'm a co-investor with Campbell Soup. One of the companies, they, they wanted to pivot and become a cheese company. It's you know, a little bit of exaggeration, but not too much. And that is perfectly fine. And when they do so, I do not participate on the follow ones because they're in a different strategic direction. But if they choose to do so, that, that's fine as well. Um, other corporations, and you, you need to be very careful if you are inviting them what their objectives is and make sure that it's very clear. You ask them, if you're an entrepreneur, you ask them what the metrics that they are measured on. And knowing that will help whether you are aligned. Most of the time I'm aligned with my financial investors because one of my metrics is the financial goal. I want an early exit. I want to get you know, 10x if possible, 4x I will take it. Um, and I want um, some of the larger um, companies uh, to be able to buy it and scale it up faster. You know, one of my first exits six years ago was a company called Bitzer, um, cybersecurity company for the iPhones. We were the first corporate user. ExxonMobil was the second corporate user. We were very happy. And Oracle bought the company and the scaling up, much, much, it was much easier for us to, to work with Oracle as a Chevron. Excellent. Okay. Cl Clint, can you talk about the data that Ulu uses to make funding decisions? Yeah, so sometimes we talk about ourselves as being data-driven decision makers, which is actually in, in some ways not true at all. I mean, we're like judgment-driven decision makers because like we're making bets about the future and, and not about what's happening in the next six months. It's really much more of what's happening in the next five to ten years. And so, so when we collect the data, well, we've got a couple of sources. So one source is the entrepreneurs themselves. So like there's the, they have the market insights, they're the ones that are creating the product. So in the market and the product area, we're really looking to the entrepreneurs to provide, if you will, data. Really, it's their assessments about how the world's going to change. And that's the interesting part, which is how is the world going to be different in the future than it was in the past? Because it was just like it was in the past, guess what? If you see a big market opportunity, so does everybody else. And everybody else is much better positioned to go after this. So it's the, it's the step functions as to, well, how the future is different than the past that's interesting there. Now, there are, having said that, there are a few places where data is useful. And I would say that's on things like dilution. So most entrepreneurs radically underestimate the amount of capital they need and what's going to happen to their dilution. So, and by the way, it's pretty easy to go get this data. So you can take a look at companies that go public and ask the question, well, what percent did the founders have at the time they went public? So they started out owning 100% of the company, and the time you go public, well, so off the chart ownership would be like Mark Zuckerberg at Facebook, who owned about half of it at the time that it went public. But that's off the charts. Much more typical are things like, oh, if you own 10 or 15%, right? So you got you know, 85 to 90% dilution, that's more typical. And it's, by the way, there's plenty of examples where the original founders own like 2 or 3% of the company by the time they go public. So, so that's something where, like I said, because, and, and entrepreneurs don't have a lot of experience with this, whereas we see it all the time and we collect information on it. So we've got a set of, call it benchmark data on dilution. Same thing with exit multiples. If somebody's gonna buy you, well, at what price are they gonna pay? Well, there's a track record about that, and if you're a public company, you have public company comps and so forth. So there definitely are areas where we use data, but most of this data, okay, so maybe it took us a couple of weeks to really sort it all out, and maybe once a quarter we kind of update this stuff, but it's really low overhead kind of data. And I, I contrast that, by the way, to folks looking at really big data sets. So there are VCs out there that are looking at 
what's happening on Twitter and GitHub and various kinds of social media to try to get signals in terms of, okay, which kinds of companies are taking off and which kind of companies should I focus on? So they're actually dealing with real-time big data, but that's not Ulu at all. I mean, we're, like I said, judgment. Thank you. K Kamal, um, when looking at you know, using decision analysis and venture capital, and we've talked about you know, the lack of decision analysis and, and VC decision making, um, how can a DA professional uh, look to you in terms of your interest as a consumer? All right, the answer is with Sherry there, the RDA person from <laughs> Sherry on CTV. Um, we don't use DA enough. Right? And when I was asked to come to this panel first, I said, oh my God, Victor, we don't do much. And then we talked about what we already do, maybe because of the DNA of Chevron. You know, we, we do the framing, you know, we, we look at different alternatives, probabilistic, you know, exit values, bring some of the data in, but nowhere near what uh, Clint showed us yesterday, what, what he does, and that is, uh, that is very important. And so uh, we are fortunate enough within CTV having, you know, two DA professionals full time looking at the, the value capture, value analysis, and, 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 and helping with um, some of the game theories on the exit. And what we need to do is bring more of, of the DA on the decision-making process and maybe take some of the bias out. As, as Clint said, most of uh, the decisions are driven by judgment. We, the bias that we bring in is slightly different uh, than a venture firm. We bring the subject matter experts bias into our decisions. Now, will we be using this product? What's the problem it will solve? What's the probability that it will solve? Uh, we need to integrate somehow that bias with, with the market data in the, in the DA side of things and, and, and to work. I think that's an action item for us uh, to take it back to templates that, that we got yesterday and, and work on it. So there's long ways to go. Um, I think every single step will help to take the bias out. We talked about, you know, it's, it's very, um, it's very homogeneous group. You know, the venture capital, you know, if you think the corporate boards are, you know, homogeneous venture capital partners are, are worse. And the investment decisions that, that, that people make are driven by that bias. Anything we can do to take that bias out will be, will be very helpful. So, so that leads to another question that um, the audience had, which is what are some of the biggest biases that you individually have in the judgment process of the decision, and how do you deal with that? Uh, I'm going to take a stab at that. Well, one of the reasons we do collective intelligence is it turns out if you get enough people around the table, you can kind of average out some of the biases that people bring in. Because uh, I think that's one of the big problems is because, uh, uh, and I'll give you an example. We did not set out in our investment thesis to have any you know, other thing than, you know, have a scoring platform. Well, guess what happened? We ended up funding about 40% of our companies are run by women. And that is different from the VC industry by about a factor of 10. Um, and, uh, and that was without intention. So that has to do with what I would view as simply a scientific process that says, of course, you're going to trend more towards a normal distribution simply because you're using a process. There's no reason that gender should have anything to do uh, with the success of a company. And we have about over half are either minority run or female run. And again, and, and, and by the way, we, we've had stories then from the women that, yeah, that this was a place for where they could get a, a fair shot because it was data based. And there's a lot of evidence out there that uh, bias does come into decision making. I mean, stories of I'll support your deal if you support mine. Uh, you know, I knew this person, this guy in, in school, and he went to the same school, so we're gonna try to help you out. We just like you, and we're gonna try to help you out. So there's a lot of capital that gets sprayed in the wrong places simply because of that bias. And that's not good for the investors, it's not good for the startups, it's not good for the world economy. I think knowing your biases is the first step. And I, 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 let me tell you, I don't like spin-outs, right? So everybody knows I don't like spin-outs. That's a bias that I have. 
And I don't make the decision, right? We make the decision as a team and investment committee. So knowing that helps. And the fact that my venture execs know that I have the bias and they need to come and say, look, okay, tell me, tell me why we should do this. What is different about it? Um, but a lot of the biases that are most dangerous are the ones you don't even know. And, and you need you know, really good people around you to point that out to you. So you know, data helps, but you know, I think you need to look in self and say, you know, I, I also always also say, I don't like traveling, right? So if a company is too far away, I have a bias against <laughs> that. So um, you, you, you need to know those and, and, and see how it goes. So, so, so I'd say I, I'm a sucker for a killer business model. So if somebody comes to me with a business model, it's like, oh, that thing just sings. Boy, this is going to be beautiful if it works. And uh, I have my, my wife, who's my partner at Ulu, has a very different perspective on things. So I remember we had this one company a while back. I was like, oh, my God, this one's fabulous. So she's sitting there. It's kind of like, this one's going to be a mess. If we invest, you're cleaning it up. <laughs> and I'm like, oh, not a problem. So, so I'm on the board. And of course, like four months later, I get a call. There's two founders. So one founder, who is the head of engineering, basically said, you know that other founder I've got, the CEO? He's got no clue what he's doing. You need to fire him or I'm leaving and taking the engineering team with me. OK. So ever since then, Miriam now has a veto on any people issues she sees. <laughs> By the way, I actually stepped in as CEO of that company, found another CEO, and they actually had a reasonable exit. So it was so from the outside in, it looks like a happy ending. But if you look at like all the calories spent to get versus you know like only a modest exit, it's like I don't want any more of those. <laughs> very good, very good. And um, you actually started in DA as a DA practitioner and moved into a different field. Do you think that's a, a really good approach for spreading DA applications uh, for DAs to move into other areas? Oh, so you've just tapped into a big area for me. So, so from Day one of Ron Howard's class at Stanford, I was a total convert. I was like, oh my God, the first thing that I've seen that makes sense for my life, right? It's the analytics, it's the conversation, it's the philosophy. I mean, it just totally sung for me. So I, when I got out of Stanford, I was on a mission to democratize decision analysis. You know, by God, that was what I was all about. And I spent 15 years starting companies um, and largely breaking my sword on that vision. And I also found out I wasn't a very good entrepreneur along the way too. So, so now I've got kind of a, I sort of reframed myself. And it's like, okay, well, who out there has really changed an industry? And you got so Stephen Covey out there writing a book. Do I write a book? So I did, it sold a few copies. Um, <laughs> all right, so I need a different way to change the industry. And, uh, and I was like, well, you know, Warren Buff is kind of, Buffett's kind of an interesting character. You know, he's not out there proselytizing anything but everybody's just coming to him and hanging on his every word. It's like, that sounds like a pretty cool way to go about democratizing decision analysis. So that's kind of my, my current plan, which is, all right, if I'm successful enough in the venture world, then I'm actually gonna have people coming to me and saying, oh my God, Clint, how did you do it? And my response is gonna be, well, it's actually not much of a mystery. Here it is, right? I mean, here's a whole tool set, knock yourself out. And that's already happening. Right? And it's happening, yeah. Matter of fact, just two weeks ago, uh, I, sponsored, well, I sponsored a workshop, it was kind of interesting, I sponsored a workshop a couple of days ago here talking about you know, decision analysis and venture capital. And I did almost the exact same thing two weeks ago for 15 VCs who came in and said they want to learn more about what, what Ulu's doing. And I shared with them basically this, the same kind of framework. Here's a decision analysis framework, here's our Excel spreadsheet template, here's why we do the things that we do. And so there's definitely, there's, you know, there's a few folks that are starting to pay attention. So, Victor, if you let me, I'll ask a question to Clint. Was it easier to teach DA to the venture capitalist, or is it easier to teach venture capital to the DA people? You know, it, it was a little bit of a head spinner for me. It, so, so it's like, you know, in the venture capital world, I'm, I, I, like, know the argument. So I say things like percent ownership doesn't matter. And that's the equivalent of saying <laughs> in the DA world, it's like decisions and outcomes don't worry about those two things. <laughs> so. So, so, I mean, it's the same kind of, but, you know, like, you know, just very different. Well, we, we are uh, running out of time, so I want to thank all the panelists. If e any of you have a, a final word you want to say to the group, please go ahead. Thanks for having us. Thank you, thank thank you very you. much, everybody.